Hi, welcome everyone. Happy holidays. We're so happy that you're here to hear Dr. Gorgi talk about newborn medicine for attorneys. I'm Amy Fogelman, and I'm honored to be here as the founder and CEO of High Rock Experts. I've dedicated over, dedicated over two decades to caring for patients with, within the Harvard affiliated practices in the Boston area. And that journey led me to High Rock Experts, which um, began with the core mission to provide ethical and credible experts reviews. And since our inception in 2018, we've successfully matched over 500 medical experts with attorneys across the United States, delivering reliable support to the legal community. In 2020, we took our commitment a step further by creating High Rock Academy. This platform was designed to empower medical professionals with the skills needed to become credible experts themselves. And today we have the privilege of introducing one of our Academy graduates, Dr. Nassim Gorgi, who will share her insights with you shortly. So um, let's briefly discuss today's agenda. After Dr. Gorgi's presentation, we will have time for questions. Just to let you know, the chat is disabled, but if you have any questions, you put them in the Q&A form and I will try to unmute um, you so you'll be able to actually ask Dr. Gorgi live. And then finally, make sure that you stay at the end of the presentation so that um, you can receive the bonuses that I will be sharing with you. So let's move on to our main event. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Gorgi. Dr. Nassim Gorgi is board certified ne neonatologist with 10 years of neonatology experience in the Boston area. She completed her pediatric residency at UMass Chan Medical School and her fellowship in neonatal perinatal medicine at Tufts. She was an assistant professor of pediatrics at UMass Chan Medical Center for five years and also held roles as director of the NICU simulation and director of NICU training and trainee education, associate program director, of the Neonatal Perinatal Medicine Fellowship and co-director of a course in the medical school. She is currently a neonatologist at Mount Auburn Hospital, which is a teaching hospital affiliated with Harvard Medical School and at Boston Medical Center. She enjoys teaching residents and medical students and has received teaching awards throughout the years for her teaching. She feels honored to be a neonatologist and to help care for newborns and their families during one of the hardest and scariest times of her, their lives. And as an expert in neonatology, she is available for consultation and case review for attorneys. Nassim lives in Bedford with her husband and five-year-old twins who interestingly decided to see firsthand what their mom does for a living by being born prematurely. Okay, take it over. Great. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. And thank you, Dr. Fogelman, for your kind introduction. Next slide. Uh, what I hope to accomplish today is clarifying some of the confusing aspects of newborn care and highlighting some of the important details to pay attention to when caring for newborns. So we'll be going over the levels of neonatal intensive care unit care, um, important history, delivery room management, the newborn exam, morbidity and mortality and prematurity. And then we'll go over a sample case as well as having time for questions. Next slide, please. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry for the... Uh... Okay, there we go. Um, the levels of neonatal care in Massachusetts can be confusing, so I wanted to take some time to explain this. Um, other states have slightly different level designations, so this information pertains to Massachusetts. Um, when in doubt, you can look up the specific details online as the DPH outlines the criteria for each level with regard to personnel, um, presence of personnel, and the number of births. To further complicate pictures, each hospital has their own guidelines regarding staffing, 
and which providers are in-house 24 seven versus available from home. So the designation of level three or four is reserved for the NICUs that take care of the sickest and smallest infants. Boston Children's NICU is designated as a level three dash four due to its ability to care for complex neonates with all conditions and because it offers um, cardiac surgery and has ECMO available in the hospital. Um, the other large academic NICUs like Boston Medical Center, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, the Brigham, Mass General, Tufts, UMass Bay State, those are all level three NICUs. And they are similar to Boston Children's in that they have pediatric subspecialties and pediatric surgery, but they are different um, since they send their infants to children's for heart surgery. There are other nuances within some of the Boston hospitals regarding pediatric surgery and centralization of surgical repair. Um, not to further complicate how we name NICUs, but level two NICUs are also called special care nurseries, level two nurseries, or continuing care nurseries. So in a level two B, um, they take care of infants born at 32 weeks or greater. Examples are Mount Auburn Hospital, where I spend a lot of my clinical time, Newton Wellesley Hospital and Lowell General. These units care for infants on CPAP, which is breathing assistance that is not invasive and doesn't go into the actual airway like intubation does. Each unit can apply for ventilation waivers to keep infants intubated for a period of time as well. So this means that certain level 2Bs, not all, may be allowed to keep infants on the ventilator for designated periods of time without needing to transfer the infant to a higher level of care, such as level three. Um, neonatologists are not necessarily present in-house 24 seven in all level two Bs, but they are immediately available. In a level two A unit, um, this is where we take care of infants born at 34 weeks or greater. Level 2A units are unable to maintain infants on CPAP or intubated other than in the stabilization for transfer to a higher level of care. They can provide oxygen via nasal cannula. Those are prongs that go into the nose. Um, and neonatologists remain immediately available at all times. In a level 1B, um, this is where they take care of infants born at 35 weeks and above, and they can provide oxygen via the nasal cannula as well. Um, infants can be fed with feeding tubes in these units. Um, one example of such a unit is the continuing care nursery at Beth Israel Deaconess Plymouth Hospital. And in a level one unit, they take care of well and stable infants born at 35 weeks and above. The point I wanna make in discussing the details of the levels of care in Massachusetts is that there are many nuances and when questions regarding the potential delay in transfer come up, it's best to look up the details of that specific unit. Next slide. Um, newborn medicine is really one of the few areas of medicine where the history of the mother has a big impact on the patient or the infant in our case. Um, knowing key information about the maternal history is necessary. And if you found all the G's and P's and the charts confusing, you're really not the only one. But the big um, take home point is that G is for gravita and shows the number of times a woman has been pregnant and the P stands for para and shows the number of live births a woman has had. So a G2P1 means a woman has been pregnant twice and had one live birth. Knowing the weeks of pregnancy will help you figure out what type of support an infant will need when born. For example, the needs of an infant born at 30, um, 25 weeks are different from those of an infant born at 39 weeks. Prenatal labs can show if you um, can show you if the woman has certain types of infections and therefore highlight risk to the infant. Um, maternal medications also give you information about risk to the infant. Prenatal care and any unusual findings on prenatal ultrasound can also indicate any potential follow-up for the infant after birth or risk of certain conditions. And I have to stress the importance of the placenta and helping us figure out the causes of some newborn problems um, in cases where the neonate requires a lot of support at delivery to help them breathe or need chest compressions. It's always a good idea to ask our OB colleagues to send the placenta to pathology. Um, this is especially important in cases where the new newborn has a seizure. The placenta can give us clues about the environment the fetus was living in and can give us reasons for why the baby may be sick. Next slide, please. Resuscitation um, is the process of how we support newborns at birth. 
while the majority of newborns are able to make the transition to extrauterine life without much help, many will require assistance to begin breathing. Roughly four to 10% of late preterm or term infants will need providers to provide breaths to them. The Neonatal Resuscitation Program, or NRP, um, is evidence-based approach uh, to care of the newborn at birth and facilitates um, effective team-based care for healthcare professionals who um, care for newborns at the time of delivery. So in terms of personnel, um, at least one person skilled in initiating neonatal resuscitation should be present at every delivery. An additional skilled person capable of performing a complete resuscitation should be immediately available. Um, I've been an NRP instructor for almost 10 years and regularly teach various providers the hands-on skills on what to do at deliveries. Um, every delivery room should be set up with the equipment needed to help a baby who may not be breathing or who may have a heart rate that is not normal. This equipment is made up of a warmer, warm blankets, uh, breathing equipment, suction devices to clear mucus and secretions from the mouth and nose that can make it difficult for infants to breathe, and breathing and heart rate monitors. In the event that the infant requires advanced support, a neonatal code cart should be located nearby. Next slide, please. So this is the algorithm that we follow during neonatal resuscitation. Newborns are different from adults in many ways, but one important key difference is the reason their heart may not be beating fast enough or have a low heart rate. Um, in cases when the infant's heart rate is low, it's almost never because there's an actual problem with the heart. When the newborns require help at birth and have a low heart rate, it's usually caused by a problem with the lungs or the airway. This is why it's extremely important to adequately support the baby's breathing and to make sure we go through all the steps to ensure we have supported the breathing before we rush to chest compressions. And this is one key component of the NRP algorithm. Um, in a state of panic, providers may forget this, and it's one of the reasons I'm an NRP instructor. Um, if the infant has a heart rate less than 100 beats per minute or is not breathing effectively, you need to give the infant breaths. Next slide, please. So the APGAR score, um, which was devised by Virginia APGAR in 1952, she was a physician here in um, the United States. Um, it's a quick scoring tool to assess the clinical status of an infant at birth. There are five components and you can get a maximum of two points in each category. Um, as you see the little mnemonic on the side is the APGAR. Um, so appearance is we use to assess the coloration of the infant. Are they cyanotic and completely blue or have normal coloration at birth? Um, pulse is really a key intervention point if the heart rate is normal or above 100 or if it's not. Um, we look at the grimace and then activity, how a baby is moving spontaneously, and then their respiratory effort. Are they not breathing? Do they have um, weak or slow breathing or are they breathing and have a nice cry? So you give the infant a score at one minute and five minutes, and you keep giving a score every five minutes until the infant reaches a score of seven. In the majority of cases, you're done at the five minute mark and that's it. Um, there are many factors that can influence an APGAR score. Some examples are maternal medications. So SSRIs, you know, used for anxiety and depression. Um, infants exposed to maternal SSRIs can have an increased risk of respiratory distress at birth. Uh, maternal magnesium. So women are often on this medication when they have um, preeclampsia. Infants with this exposure can be very sleepy and sometimes even require intubation. Maternal anesthesia. Um, infants can be sleepy and need help with breathing as well. And then you always have to factor gestational age. You know, a baby at 25 weeks is not going to have quite the same activity as a baby at term. So that factors into the APGAR as well. And then congenital anomalies, the infant may not be vigorous at birth um, or have breathing issues depending on what type of anomaly is present. Next slide, please. Um, completing a thorough exam is important. This exam um, really must be tailored to the infant as there are certain parts of the exam that will be done differently in very preterm infants or infants who are extremely sick and requiring a lot of support. Um, one example, um, is that infants born prematurely, extremely prematurely, so as early as 23 weeks, 24 weeks, um, will have fused eyelids. So you are unable to look into their eyes to check the light reflexes at birth. 
Um, all elements of the exam are important. And depending on the issue or the problem an infant may have, you'll need to pay attention, um, to pay more attention to the exam of that part of the body. So let's take an example of an infant with um, difficulty tolerating feeds. You will want to pay particular attention to the abdominal exam in this case. The general appearance of an infant can provide a lot of information as well. For example, is the infant being described as well-appearing and alert, or is the infant being described as sleepy and in distress? Next slide, please. Newborns have a number of reflexes we call primitive reflexes. They are signs of nervous system development and function. Some of these reflexes are supposed to be present at birth, and when they aren't present or when they are diminished, it can be a sign there's a problem. I'm not going to talk about all the reflexes, but wanted to mention the Moro and the suck reflex. So the Moro reflex is also called the startle reflex. This reflex is shown in the picture. The provider can elicit this re reflex by supporting the infant with their hand, um, like pictured and allowing their hand to drop backward with the infant. This, um, the infant should then bring their arms kind of upward, outward and inward like shown. The more reflex is involuntary response to stimulation. So absence or an incomplete ability to do that with the arms can indicate there is a problem with the baby. The suck reflex is when the infant sucks on um, the provider's gloved finger or a pacifier. An absent or weak suck can sometimes mean there is a neurologic issue. Next slide, please. And if you've been involved in neonatal cases, you have a grasp of the definition of prematurity. The reason why I bring this up is to stress that preterm infants are not the same as term infants. Prematurity brings a unique list of issues that are not applicable to term infants. And even with, within the definition of prematurity, not all preemies are the same. Next slide, please. Um, unfortunately, being born prematurely can present many challenges for neonates. Generally speaking, the earlier an infant is born, the higher the risk the infant is to have complications. These are some of the most common complications a preterm infant may face, but is certainly not an exhaustive list. So the first, looking at the respiratory system, uh, respiratory failure when you can't breathe effectively, um, could present at birth or any time after. Um, some extremely premature infants have lungs that are too underdeveloped to survive. Other infants have respiratory or breathing complications along the way. Sepsis. This is the medical term for infection. Infants born prematurely are at increased risk of infection, which can persist during their hospital course. Their immune systems are just not strong, and they are at risk for getting ill from bacteria and viruses. Necrotizing enterocolitis is one of the most common GI emergencies in preterm infants. This is where you have inflammation and development of gas into the bowel wall. Um, intraventricular hemorrhage, or IVH, we really like these three-word abbreviations in the NICU. Um, this is where you have bleeding inside and around spaces in the brain. Um, infants born premature are at risk of IVH because the blood vessels that line those spaces are fragile. IVH is largely a phenomenon of birth before 32 weeks, but can occur in later gestations in some cases. And then congenital anomalies is a broad category to describe any abnormality present at birth. Infants with anomalies are more likely to be born preterm and have greater challenges due to the compounded impact of the anomaly and prematurity. For example, an infant born with a certain type of genetic syndrome or complication is more likely to be born early because of this genetic syndrome. Next slide, please. So I would now like to talk about a case that I experienced um, to bring together some of the concepts we have talked about and, um, and to bring in some other important concepts. So we have a woman who arrives um, to labor and delivery with vaginal bleeding and abdominal pain. A fetal monitor is placed and the fetal heart rate is found to be low. A normal fetal heart rate is generally between about 110 to 160 beats per minute. So we all start getting a little bit nervous when the heart rate is lower than 100 beats per minute. Um, as you may recall from the slides about resuscitation, a heart rate less than 100 beats per minute in a neonate is um, caused to give, give the infant breaths. 
So this fetus has a heart rate of 80, which is not normal. Next slide, please. In terms of this woman's history, this fetus was conceived via IVF due to a longstanding history of infertility and miscarriages. So this woman was a G4P0. Um, this history tends to suggest that this is a much wanted pregnancy for this woman. Um, the pregnancy was otherwise um, uncomplicated. Next slide, please. So here you have a woman with bleeding, abdominal pain, and a low fetal heart rate. This can mean a life-threatening situation for this mother and the infant. Um, the decision is made to take this woman for a stat cesarean section. This means an emergency C-section uh, where the goal is to get the baby out as quickly as possible. The woman continues to bleed heavily as the team is preparing the operating room. So here in the left corner, you have the neonatal team setting up the warmer and equipment. In this case, you wanna make sure you have the neonatal code cart right by you. You always do your best to anticipate emergent situations like this. Um, in a case like this, you may ask for extra people to help. Um, depending on the story, you may open the code cart and get foods or medications ready. Um, because everything is moving quickly with the need to get the fetus out, there isn't time to give the woman an epidural. So she must be placed under general anesthesia which means she will be intubated and give her de um, given deeper sedation. As the neonatal team, we care about this because general anesthesia for mom can make the baby sleepy and not want to breathe. The mother is terrified and crying out to make sure we save her baby right before they put her under general anesthesia. What I also did not tell you before is that the mother is a pediatrician which means that she is aware of the danger both she and her fetus are in at the moment. Next slide, please. As the OBs are um, trying to get the infant out quickly, they discover the uterus has ruptured or torn. So the infant comes out depressed. This is an infant who is not breathing, has no tone, poor color, and the heart rate is low and not normal. Our team begins the resuscitation. Um, because the infant's heart rate is low and the infant isn't breathing, I begin um, giving the infant breaths with the resuscitation bag. The infant um, also requires oxygen. Since the infant isn't responding properly to these interventions, we troubleshoot the situation and I end up ultimately needing to intubate the infant with a breathing tube. Thankfully, the heart rate increases to normal and the infant does not require chest compressions. Um, the infant is then transitioned from the operating room to the level two nursery. Since the mother is under general, um, general anesthesia, I am unable to communicate with her, but I do speak with the partner on our way back to the level two. Next slide, please. So what now? Um, this infant was assigned a very low APGAR score, only given points for heart rate and color. The scores never came up above a three, so we really stopped counting at 10 minutes. Whenever we encounter a neonate with depression at birth or a traumatic start to life where the infant requires a lot of support from us at delivery, we always need to ask ourselves if this is an infant um, who is a candidate for a treatment called therapeutic hypothermia. Therapeutic hypothermia is the medical terminology for cooling or more simply put, keeping an infant's entire body cold. I'm going to talk more about what cooling is in a few slides, but essentially keeping the body cool in infants who meet certain criteria has been shown to improve outcomes. And we will talk more about this later. So in order to help answer the question about whether our infant will need cooling, we require more information. Um, we use blood samples from the umbilical cord to help give us a picture of the condition of the fetus at the time of birth. These blood samples are taken from the placental side of the umbilical cord shortly after a baby is born and need to be drawn quickly in order to be more accurate. It is usually the labor and delivery nurses who obtain these blood samples. We look at the, the acids and bases in the blood to help us figure out how stressed a baby is surrounding the time it was born. Your body always tries to balance the acids and bases in the body. Sometimes having too much acid in the blood, which is also called metabolic acidosis, is a sign that the infant did not get enough oxygen delivered to its body around the time of delivery. The umbilical cord looks like a smiley face and has two arteries and one vein, just um, like in the top picture. We sample blood from the vein and the artery if we can, 
but the arterial cord blood sample is a better indicator of fetal status. This concept is important. The fetus needs oxygen to survive and oxygen rich blood is carried from the placenta um, to the fetus through the umbilical vein. You and I breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. The fetus goes through a similar process. It's a little bit more complicated, um, but the fetus receives oxygen rich blood from the umbilical vein and then sends away carbon dioxide back to the placenta through the umbilical arteries. So this explains why a blood sample from the umbilical artery is a better picture of the state of the fetus. If the infant is more stressed, it may have increased acids in its system. Samples of blood from the umbilical cord aren't perfect, and there are nuances that may come into play during specific newborn cases. There are times when the blood samples from the umbilical cord cannot be obtained, or the accuracy of the sample is questioned, or more information is desired. In these cases, we also obtain a blood sample from the infant within the first hour of life to measure the acids and bases in the body. The third factor that will help us figure out if this infant needs to be cooled is through our examination of the infant, specifically focusing on the neurologic exam. Serial neurologic exams are important as the exam can change over time. Next slide, please. In cases where the neonate is depressed at birth and there's question about cooling treatment, you will often see the providers mention SARNET staging in their assessments. SARNET and SARNET were a husband and wife physician duo who devised the scoring system in describing neonates who were born with fetal distress. Um, they published these findings in 1976 and SARNET staging is still widely used with some modifications. This scoring system is trying to determine how bad an infant's neurologic status or state is. Um, poor neurologic function is also called encephalopathy. Healthy babies should look alert and have normal activity and normal reflexes. With SARNET staging, you are giving the infant a score of mild, moderate, or severe encephalopathy um, based on the exam findings. Next slide, please. So back to our case, um, I examined the infant again in the level two nursery and found the infant to have the following neurologic exam. The infant was not alert and was very sleepy, had decreased spontaneous movement of the arms and the legs, decreased tone and really weak reflexes. These aren't pictures of the newborn from this case, but show low tone in a newborn, which really isn't normal. Our newborn had a similar exam. The infant's body shouldn't curl around your hand when um, you are holding it and supporting its belly, they should have more tone and not be as loose. Um, based on our exam findings, the infant was assessed to have moderate encephalopathy. Next slide, please. So knowing everything that we now know about this infant, does this infant meet criteria for cooling? So we had presence of a sentinel event or a traumatic event. Examples of a sentinel event before or during labor are uterine rupture, as was the case for us, um, placental abruption, cord prolapse, significantly low heart rate at birth, et cetera. So we have that. Um, there was evidence of increased acids in the body or metabolic acidosis. And the infant is showing signs of a diminished or altered neurologic status, so encephalopathy. Other signs consistent with an acute stressful event surrounding the time of delivery are an APGAR score less than five at 10 minutes of life. I do want to mention that not all cases of neonatal encephalopathy are due to birth stress or trauma at birth. We must always be thinking about that in our cases. Next slide, please. Not all depressed neonates qualify for cooling. In general, the eligibility criteria for cooling requires infants to be greater than or equal to 36 weeks, but many centers are cooling infants at 35 weeks and some are cooling infants at 34 weeks, which is not the standard at 34 weeks, but it's being done in some of the Boston hospitals. Um, the infants need to be less than or equal to six hours of age. Um, our infant was determined to be a candidate for cooling and was transferred out of the level 2B to a level 3. As shown in this photo, the white honeycomb looking blanket wrap is the cooling blanket. Infants are cooled for 72 hours before they are rewarmed to a normal temperature. These infants usually have IVs in their umbilical vein and artery because they require 
frequent lab draws, and that way we don't have to poke the baby every time, and we can give um, fluids and nutrition through the IV as well. Assessing the infant's neurologic status is very important. We place an EEG on the infant in order to measure the brain activity and assess for seizures. These infants are increased risk for seizures that may not be noticeable by visual monitoring or your eye. The goal of cooling is to slow the progression of injury. We cannot go back in time. We cannot stop the insult that happened or the sentinel event, but cooling has been shown to slow further injury to the body. Being deprived of oxygen for enough time surrounding the time of delivery means that important organs did not receive the oxygen that they needed and can be quite injured as a result. Cooling infants with moderate to severe encephalopathy has been shown to reduce um, death and disability. Next slide, please. When we talk about injury to the neonate's body, one area of the body that we worry about is the brain. Infants who have gone through cooling will need a brain MRI once they are rewarmed and stable. This MRI can be helpful in determining if and to what extent the infant's brain was injured. Typically, these MRI studies are done between four to seven days of life. There are certain patterns of injury we can see in infants with neonatal encephalopathy related to birth stress. Um, if the MRI shows patterns of injury that are not commonly seen in cases of birth stress, we really must look for other causes of the encephalopathy. In the case of our infant, his MRI did not show brain injury, but his story does not end here as he will be followed by his pediatrician, pediatric neurology, the developmental follow-up clinic, and early intervention, which are developmental specialists that go into the home or school and work with babies um, to ensure that his development is properly monitored. Next slide, please. Now I would like to um, open up the floor for any questions that you may have. Great. Um, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I, I really learned a lot, I have to say. Um, if you guys could please put your questions into the Q&A. Um, I have some questions that some attorneys who were not able to make it today asked me. Um, but before that, I actually had a question and I'm sorry um, if this does not, if this isn't interesting to other people, but I'm, I was a little confused about why a ruptured uterus happening during birth was considered a sentinel event for a newborn. How does that affect the newborn? Can you explain that? Sure. Well, sentinel events, um, I had mentioned a couple of different causes, but essentially, you know, your uterus is the house where the baby lives and where your placenta is attached. And any time where that situation is dis, you know, interrupted or disrupted, you're at risk for not getting adequate blood and oxygen to the baby. Um, so that is actually a pretty serious um, event that can happen that puts the baby at risk for hypoxia or lack of blood flow. Got it. Um, we have a question here um, from Dr. Pollock. I'm going to try to get him to answer this live. Hold on. Let's see if we can do this. Um, our participants. All right. Attorney Pollock, um, I am going to ask you to speak if you can ask your questions directly. If not, I can, I can just, I can read them. The question that that attorney Pollock asks, I'll, I'll read it. You have to unmute yourself, Russ, is who decides whether to take a cord gas? Sorry. Had, oh, good. Go ahead. You talk. Okay. So I've had cases, you know, involving uh, uh, birth injuries, um, and we could not find uh, an arterial cord gas that was being done. Mm -hmm. um, who decides whether an arterial cord gas is going to be done in conjunction with delivery? Um, or what are the criteria for taking one? Are they always supposed to be taken? We did find a venous blood gas later on in the NICU records, but um, we were shocked that they didn't, um, even though they had to resuscitate the child, that they didn't take an arterial cord gas at birth. Yeah, that's a great question. And I will say one of the struggles that we encounter on a regular basis in neonatology um, 
So oftentimes, um, if I want a cord gas to be done, I will verbalize that in the delivery room to the obstetricians. I think some hospitals may have protocols where if a baby is resuscitated and requires any type of resuscitation, even giving breaths, they will automatically do that. Um, but it's not an automatic at most hospitals. So I think there has to be really good communication between the pediatric or neonatology team and the obstetricians to obtain that. I wonder if in the case you describe, they were not able to get both, um, which sometimes happens, either sticking a really small needle into that vessel, as you can imagine, um, there are situations where they can't get both because they did obtain the venous, um, is what I wonder. Um, I don't know the answer to that, actually. Yeah. Um, while I have you, let me ask another question. You put up a flow chart concerning resuscitation. Was that yes. simply... Um, oxygenation resuscitation, or did that cover all types of resuscitation, such as, you know, positioning the infant, uh, uh, you know, fluid boluses and things of that nature? So that's a good question. So um, the resuscitation and um, that the algorithm that I put up um, is a, the resuscitation that we follow in all deliveries, um, slide nine, that really talks about respiratory, so breathing okay. and heart rate, um, and then gives, um, you know, indications for when you need to do chest compressions, uh, fluids and giving fluids are a little bit more complicated, but it does talk about IV epinephrine, F um, sorry, epinephrine, okay. um, because if the heart rate is really low and your baby has not responded to respiratory measures as well as chest compressions, you're moving into medications. So at the very bottom, it does talk about epi um, and indications to give that, but other fluids in terms of normal saline and blood are not really outlined um, specifically on the algorithm. All right, I mean, well, first of all, very, very helpful. We, I appreciate you, uh, you. Uh, giving this presentation. Last question, what's the overlap between neonatology and pediatric neurology. I've had cases where I've had uh, pediatric neurologists on causation issues, but also neonatologists. Is there overlap? What's uh, the difference in roles of you guys and the pediatric neurologists? Yeah, so that's a good question as well. I mean, there's always overlap. Um, we look at the whole body and the whole baby. A pediatric neurologist is uh, specifically trained to focus on the brain, um, you know, MRI findings, EEGs, and follow-up of the infant after they leave the hospital. So there very much is overlap um, and discussions, but, um, but, you know, we need subspecialists to help us figure out a little bit more what, what's going on. In a lot of institutions, when we think that a baby qualifies for cooling, um, we do get neurology involved because they have a more focused and um, specific training with regard to the exam. We don't necessarily delay cooling. If an infant absolutely needs to be cooled, we do that and then get neurology. But there are, and you've probably experienced yourself, there are many cases that are in the gray zone um, where yeah. you're really trying to figure out if a baby needs to be cooled. And I would say having neurology involved is really helpful. Okay. Unless I'm monopolizing the discussion. I, we have I another question, questions. Russ, so I'm going to move on to someone else. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. So our next question is M. King. So I'm going to allow M. King to talk. Um, and I'm going to ask you, I'm going to unmute you. The question is, I'm I'm trying to, I'm reading it as I'm asking M. King to unmute, but is the Kaiser Permanente sepsis, oh, go ahead, you can ask your own question. Yeah, hi, hi, Dr. Uh, Matthew King here. Um, I, I guess the question is, is how significant is the Kaiser Permanente sepsis calculation in deciding whether to administer antibiotics to a newborn um, I, I have a case in which the uh, mother developed temperatures in excess of a of a hundred. She had three or four recorded uh, temperatures in excess of a hundred degrees, 
uh, prior in the hour before she delivered the baby. Um, and uh, the if you were to rely on the Kaiser Permanente sepsis calculation alone, antibiotics would not have been given. So I was wondering what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great question. And I would say, you know, the CAPE, we call it the KP sepsis calculator. Mm -hmm. uh, we use that in our hospital. And I would say most of the institutions where I work now have adopted that calculator because it encompasses so many babies. Um, every the, the nuance with that is that every unit has a slightly different marker for incidence of early um, early onset sepsis. For example, when you pull up the calculator, if you've ever done so yourself, if you Google it, um, the first box that you pull up asks you for the predictor of incidence of early onset sepsis. So however many, you know, for example, 0.1 per thousand live births. Um, CDC uses 0.5 per thousand live births as their number. Um, Kaiser Permanente uses 0.3 per thousand. Um, the institution, one of the institutions where I work uses something in the middle. So we use that and then put in the gestational age, mom's highest temperature, what antibiotics she received, as well as her group B status. And it gives you a calculation on if the baby needs blood work and if the, the baby needs increased vital sign checks and if the baby needs antibiotics. So we, that's the kind of the gold standard of what a lot of neonatologists and units use to determine um, the baby's risk of getting sick or having an infection. Um, so we follow that all the time. And the times where we veer off that is then, you know, if the baby shows signs that there's a problem later on, for example, if you've assessed like the case you talked about, the baby does not need antibiotics, but then the baby's doing something that's not quite right or not normal later, you have to kind of reevaluate that because nothing is perfect and hundred um, percent. So there may, may be times where we end up starting a baby on antibiotics later because they're not acting or behaving normally. Okay. So I, 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 I get, if I interpret your answer, if I'm understanding your answer correctly in, in your hospital or the hospitals that you uh, work at, if the Kaiser, if the Kaiser Permanente calculation, uh, as performed by the providers, indicates no antibiotics, generally speaking, you would not give antibiotics. It would Correct. have to. Be, okay. Correct. Uh, it's a very and, good calculation tool. Unless okay. the baby changes later on, then you have to reevaluate um, based on anything unusual the baby is doing. But absolutely, um, we follow that. I think these days, right. um, antibiotic stewardship is really important. We don't like to over um, you know, give antibiotics too much, um, because it leads to bacterial resistance. And, and I, just one follow-up question, how much, um, uh, consideration do you give to, um, the mother's, uh, labor and delivery? Uh, for example, if, if there was a very, very prolonged labor and delivery, uh, with, uh, fetal tachycardia, um, recorded on, multiple occasions throughout uh, prolonged rupture of membranes. And I know the, the the Kaiser Permanente calculation factors in some, if not all of the things that I mentioned, but, um, you know, going beyond that, that calculation, do you factor into the, the maternal considerations? Um, not necessarily. I mean, there are a number of factors, as you mentioned, that are part of the calculator. And mm -hmm. then you look at the baby when they're born. So if, you know, the baby's heart rate was really high in utero or in the uterus, and then the baby is born and has totally normal vital signs and looks well, then we don't necessarily do anything differently than what the Kaiser Permanente calculator tells us. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. And just to say one other thing that Dr. Gorgi said, but if the baby is not acting right, even if the KP, um, uh, um, what, what is it called? The KP calculator. calculator says don't to use antibiotics. They may still choose to use antibiotics in, in certain circumstances based yeah. on the way that the baby is behaving. Yeah. Right, right. And that is true. Um, You always have to go, you know, you always have to take the big picture into account and go with what the baby you know, is clinical showing. judgment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, I guess with maternal history, if the baby came 
out an amniotic fluid that was very concerning looking, then mm-hmm. that could factor in to the situation as well. Thank you for that, Dr. Fogelman. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, and then we have another um, another question from Attorney Pollock. Is there, um, what is the criteria for performing head, Im- head, Im- head imaging in the NICU? Um, so do you mean with regard to post cooling or um, before we cool? Can you clarify that question for me, please? Um, hold on, I'm gonna allow him to talk. I feel like I'm a DJ here. <laughs> I'm trying to, here, allow to talk. Okay, okay Russ, you're up, yeah. Um, I was talking more generally than than uh, pre or post cooling. First of all, do you use cooling blankets or, or, or cooling caps? But I was talking more generally. When, when do you decide if, if a newborn goes to the NICU because there was a difficult delivery, whether you're going to perform imaging to see if there's anything going on in the head? Yeah. Um, so first question, um, we do not use cooling caps anymore. There were trials looking at that type of cooling. And um, now we universally adopt whole body cooling. So we don't just cool the head, we cool the entire body. Um, the second part of your question, if you, if there's, I guess, um, I'm not sure if this is getting to your question, but if there's something that doesn't completely fit the picture of this could be related to birth stress, maybe there's something that happened in utero or there's something else not right about the baby. And it's not a slam dunk that cooling or therapeutic hypothermia is what the baby needs. Then you may be getting imaging to help you figure it out. But what I want to stress is that if you really think this baby needs to be cooled, the time window is very short. You want to cool this baby as quickly as you can, and you have six hours. So you're not going to use an MRI to help you figure out if you need to cool, if the baby meets other criteria. But if you're worried, there could be something else going on that shouldn't be treated with cooling, then you may go to quick imaging before. Like what kind of thing? So um, maybe there's some type of brain anomaly um, that the brain structure is not normal. Or if you suspect that the infant may have had what we call a neonatal stroke, which is different than an adult, and that's probably a discussion of in itself, Um, but something else that happened inside the uterus um, not related to birth stress then that would be that would not be a treatment that you would choose for a baby like that. But generally speaking, if you're really concerned you need to cool this baby, you're going to cool the baby and get imaging later. Um, but if you if you're worried that there's something else going on um, that would not be treated with cooling, then you do try to get imaging. Oftentimes we get head ultrasounds. Um, which are not as sensitive as MRIs. They really can't give as detailed of a view of the brain, um, but it's kind of a big picture in case there was a huge, large, devastating bleed, then that may not be a baby you want to cool. And the ultrasounds can be done in the NICU itself. You don't have to they move can. them to a different location. Yeah, they can. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then um, Attorney Pollock also wanted to know if you consult and testify in cases against healthcare providers in Massachusetts. I don't, I don't know what your feeling is about that. So there's always, um, you know, working in a small community, you just want to make sure that you don't know the other provider work directly with them or have. So there's always that nuance. Um, we have a lot of NICUs here in Boston area, so I don't know everybody. Um, so I think it would, it would just have to depend on the case and to make sure I don't have any conflicts of interest. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Excellent. Um, any last final thoughts, Nassim, before we go on to um, just the final part of the presentation? No, thank you so much. This was really fun. <laughs> okay, great. So um, thank you, everybody. Grab her um, her email. It's ngorgi, G-O-R-J-I at gmail.com. Um, if you have any questions, reach out to her directly. Um, she is available for cases. And um, 
So just want to remind you that just like Dr. Gorgi, you can see how great she is at High Rock Experts. We have access to over 4,000 experts just like her to help you with your cases. And you know how crucial it is to find the right person for your case. So just reach out to me um, if you have any, if you need help finding an expert.